Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the 11th uh, conference of the Renovate Europe campaign. Yes, we are celebrating 10 years. You can see that over my shoulder. And uh, we're delighted that uh, you are able to join us uh, this afternoon. It seems to me that every year is an important one for the renovation uh, issues. And uh, this year is definitely no exception, as you're about to find out over the next uh, two hours. What I want to do is I wanted to start with thanks. Uh, thanks to my staff, uh, the team, Caroline, Aphrodite and Eva, and also to E3G and our graphic designers, Francesca Madonna and Benoit Toussaint. Uh, they've done a great job this year, and I think we're going to have a very stimulating conference uh, just now as we uh, listen to the results of the study on the National Recovery and Resilience Plans, and we hear reactions from governments, policymakers, and stakeholders. Today, the main hashtag to use is hashtag renovate to recover. You see it in the bottom right hand corner. And next slide, please. And we would like this to be as interactive as possible, considering the platform we're using, which is GoToWebinar. It means that you're all in listen only mode. And to interact with the panel, you must type your questions into the Q&A box. We will then monitor those and I will pitch them to the relevant speakers as we go through. I encourage you to uh, continuously uh, ask questions uh, because the more questions we have from you, the more relevant the conference will be for you. But a little warning, there are a couple of videos coming up during the session. And depending on your platform, you may be kicked out of the view you're seeing at the moment into individual windows. Don't worry, just re-enlarge the window with the video and everything should be okay. Next slide, please. So for those of you who may not know us, uh, the Renovate Europe campaign is a political communications campaign. Uh, we've been around now for 10 years and we have, we believe, had a big impact on EU policy over those 10 years. We're now at a position where renovation is on the lips of all politicians and policymakers at all levels. And we now see EU level uh, policy and strategies that are really focusing strongly on renovation. So we're very happy about that. The campaign has 49 partners. You see them here on this slide. Uh, they range from industry leaders through trade union organizations, city networks to think tanks, and on to the national level where we have 18 national partners who've been instrumental in preparing the study that you're going to see this afternoon. Of course, I don't want to forget the fact that in 2021, we're going to see the revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive, the EED, and of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Two directives where, with the right measures in place, we believe a further boost to renovation uh, can take place, both rate and depth of renovation, which is exactly what we've been calling for for 10 years. That we see an 80% reduction in the energy demand of the building stock in the EU by 2050. So much of the decade ahead, which we will also be focusing on today, is going to be looking at how to get out of the economic uh, crisis we found ourselves in because of COVID. And in the first part of our conference today, next slide, we will have the launch of the study prepared for Renovate Europe by the e by E3G. This will be followed, as I said a moment ago, by reactions and insights from three ministries. We have Croatia, we have Spain, and we have Slovakia. And we'll also have a unique insight into how to use the National Recovery and Resilience Programs uh, to leverage private finance for renovation. And as you see, the later part of the conference will consist of a, de a debate with two prominent members of the European Parliament on those emerging legal instruments, the EED and the EPPD. And we are putting, as I said a moment ago, a lot of hope into the content of those directives. But before getting to the content of the day, next slide, please. I'd like to invite you to sit back and enjoy this uh, short video, which is recalling some of the key moments of the last decade 
and looking forward to the next decade with our partners and champions. Roll it, please, Aphrodite. We're asking you today to support the, your, the Renovate Europe campaign, which this event officially launches. Renovation was, was being ignored as one of the, you know, it was clearly the most critical thing that we need to do for, for climate change, for the energy transition, then it is, is now. And I think we, we noted that whilst there was lots of work being done on, on new build and, and what needed to happen there, renovation was, was just not being taken seriously at neither the national level or the European level. And it was, it was really important to, to make that the case for renovation and to make people understand why it was so important and such a good idea in terms of climate transition to get onto renovation and focus on it. Your series of posters and videos from MEPs across the political spectrum, which I think made a really important contribution to sort of normalising renovation as part of uh, European uh, decarbonisation policy. guys have achieved a massive success story. The questions then for policy now are how do we keep going? For the next decade, we have to, we really have to keep the pressure up on, on, on renovation. I think compared to a decade ago, we now recognize that, that not only is there a huge opportunity here, but it's an opportunity that we, we just can't allow not to be taken. Uh, it's up in the next decade to implement this at national level and to really speed up the renovation rates uh, in the different member states. We hope for the years to come the general line should be kept. Maybe only the methods and the approaches will vary up in accordance with the changing environment. We are sure the involvement of new partners and people will provide a splash of new ideas and solutions. I think in the next period uh, we would really appreciate also to play at local level a more important uh, role. Uh, you have had your own great ideas uh, in the last 10 years, uh, but in view of the revision of the EPBD, ED and uh, climate obligations resulting from these and other documents in the member states, we believe that uh, it might be worth considering a close and deep uh, cooperation uh, by you and the national contributing partner. Renovate Europe, I think, should focus on um, the implementation of different uh, strategies. I wish the team at Renovate Europe a good anniversary and an inspiration for the implementation phase that is coming for the 10 years ahead to get renovations really started. Thank you. Uh, the citizens are al already paying attention to renovation. Um, this support uh, may have the right size and all we need now is to find balance between very many things. So that is 
going to need a lot of coordination. And uh, what I would wish for the next uh, upcoming years is uh, even more and or even more um, active uh, national partners. Uh, we have to uh, create new business models and new approaches, new products, uh, new services based on digitalization and uh, high-skilled uh, professionals. When we look at the next 10 years for Renovate Europe, I see that, that digitalization, we see that our buildings uh, are becoming more and more modern, so it's needed that we can communicate with the consumption and what we need and also what's the weather conditions. Let me congratulate you to your anniversary. And let me wish you for the next decade that, that simply everyone acknowledges what we already know and advocate for. And that's it. That's my wish. So good luck, take care and see you next time. Bye. Mazāki apkuras rēķini, siltāki, patīkamāki mājokļi, tie ir tikai daži no ieguvumiem, ko sniedz ēku renovāciju. The next decade is crucial to deliver ambitious renovation of the building stock in the EU. The Directive on Energy Efficiency and Energy Performance of Buildings are under revisions and there are new initiatives like the new European Bauhaus. And not to forget, we have to make the most of the recovery financing. There are plenty of opportunity to put building renovation at the centre of the EU agenda. So I hope you all enjoyed uh, that video, that it brought back some memories of uh, what we have done over the last uh, 10 years and gave you some ideas about what we should do moving forward. And I think the theme of that uh, video will come out again uh, as we go through the uh, content of the conference. So now moving on to the content, uh, you'll have seen that Eleonora Evi, the uh, champion from the European Parliament, gave us a good link uh, to the next uh, section of the conference, the National Recovery and Resilience Plans. <clears throat> so I'm now delighted to welcome uh, Vilislava Ivanova, researcher at E3G, who has undertaken with colleagues the, this study for us uh, on how transformational are the National Recovery Plans for buildings uh, renovation. Vilislava, over to you. Uh, for the presentation of the study. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, thanks, oh, everyone. It's, thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here and happy anniversary from my side as well. Um, what I will do today is, pre is to present a study that we've been undertaking over the last couple of months with Renovate Europe national partners, um, who have been absolutely instrumental in the delivery of this work. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. So uh, what I'll go through is uh, the study itself, how we approached it, uh, then the key findings and best practices we managed to identify, um, our key recommendations and next steps. Um, so going into, in, into the next slide, please. Um, so uh, our approach to the study, as I just highlighted, uh, was to work very closely with Learn that Europe's national partners. So we've conducted the study in 18 uh, member states um, with a uh, great support from, uh, from national partners, analyzing the texts uh, and helping us find all the information we need. Uh, so the, the, the countries are on the, on the slide. I wouldn't go through all of them. I'm gonna talk about some of the good examples and good practices we've seen across the board in the, in the following presentation. Um, so moving on, the next slide, please. Uh, why we did that study, it, I mean, it, it, following the introduction is probably clear for everyone, but renovation is at the intersection of the, the EU's uh, green economic and social priorities. Uh, we saw the, renovate, the national recovery plans as a unique opportunity to really kickstart the renovation waste strategy implementation on the ground. Um, at the moment, renovation is at, uh, the renovation rate in Europe is just uh, at one percent, and not all of it is deep. Actually, very little, <laughs> very little uh, amount of renovations that are currently undertaken are high depth, uh, realizing high amount of energy savings, and it is 
uh, clear at this stage that we need a linear increase of, uh, of the depth and rate of renovation to achieve the climate objectives. So according to the National Recovery uh, and Resilience Plan guidance by the European Commission, uh, there, the, there is 37% of funding needed to uh, support the green transition and 20% needed to support the digital transition. And there is a special flagship initiative, Renovate, as part of the as part of the program, which is why we expected that there will be some form of a renovation investment across all the member states. At the moment, energy efficiency investment is around 85 to 90 billion euro per year, and we know from the uh, renovation rate strategy that that needs to ri uh, rise to around 275 billion per year, which includes energy efficiency and heat decarbonisation. So in that context, it's very clear that we need a lot of public funding and that public funding alone would not be sufficient to deliver the, the rate and that the investment we need. Um, and therefore, we need also a strong enabling framework for the delivery. So moving on to the next slide. What, what we looked as part of the study is, first of all, the quantitative basis, which is how much is invested, where is it invested, what type of measures, what kind of um, energy savings are they expected to deliver? And the second, second aspect was more around how transformational the, the funding is and how much does it, uh, how much is it likely to boost renovation rate and debt and uh, address other barriers to uptake and support enabling, wider enabling conditions. I'll go into more depth into what we meant by that in the, in the following slide. However, just to highlight that we see the study as a starting point and as it will be discussed further, uh, regulatory measures would be equally important, if not, um, to support delivery on the ground. In terms of our approach to the study, then, uh, we created an assessment framework around five assessment criteria. I will go quickly through uh, all of them at a high level, and there is a way more detail into the actual report. So it's a qualitative assessment, and we focused almost exclusively on the investment measures uh, because there, are, within the within the plans, there are quite a bit of um, regulatory changes as well, which were very specific, country specific. Uh, so we thought it was uh, more appropriate to focus on the investment measures, which are more comparable between the member states. Uh, it was based on a preset uh, uh, assessment criteria, set of assessment criteria, which we applied to all countries. So the five criteria are target setting, financial landscape, integrating multiple benefits, supply chain project support and implementation framework. So within the target setting, what we try to assess is how clear the targets are in terms of what renovation funding uh, is expected to deliver, how well it is aligned to long-term renovation strategy and what depth of renovation is supported, whether it's medium or deep renovation. On the financial landscape, what we looked at is the degree to which uh, it is clear what the investment needs are within the country, whether they're articulated, whether it's clear how much uh, the recovery funding would serve alongside other sources of uh, public funds and also the degree to which it is clear how much private finance will be crowded in through the investment. In the criteria around integrating multiple benefits, uh, we looked at four different things. First of all, uh, how whether countries are targeting energy poverty allevi alleviation explicitly. Uh, how much the energy efficiency first principle is applied when it comes to heat decarbonization, uh, what measures are in place around to encourage digitalization in the renovation process, and finally, how much measures are linked to wider social benefits, uh, for instance, adaptation or accessibility. In, in the fourth criteria, which is supply chain and project support, what we looked at is uh, whether there is investment flowing towards the improvement of skills, um, and, and also technical assistance, such as one-stop shops or uh, assistance for other um, for municipalities or other delivery bodies. And finally, in the implementation framework, we just looked at the clear, how clear the institutional setup is in terms of who's delivering the plans and what responsibilities they have for them, and also what kind of targets are in place, including uh, milestones and intermediate milestones. So moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, based on that study, we uh, we got to our key key finds uh, key findings and some of the best practices, which I'm going to cover next. Um, so moving on, please. In terms of volume and the focus of investment, what we found is that across the 18 member states we looked at, uh, investment is around 40 billion euro. That is around 8.5 percent of the total total funding allocated under national recovery and resilience plans. In most, most countries allocate between 11 and 14 percent. 
of, of their funding to renovation. Uh, and there are significant variations between member states, as you would expect, from below 100 uh, million in Slovenia and Austria to 7, 8 billion in Spain and Italy. Also, of course, the per capita differences are quite significant as a result of this. The residential sector is by far taking the lead. So around 22 billion of the 40 are flowing towards residential sector investment uh, in different types of residential buildings, depending on the country's characteristics. And the public sector follows with 14 billion or 34%. So in most cases, what we saw is that countries have uh, countries expect to deliver at least medium debt renovation with the with the measures they've put in place that is realizing at least 3% primary energy savings. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. Um, the, this, uh, the question of the degree to which uh, plans are transformational is the one I'll turn to next. So across the five criteria, we saw uh, we have five country, countries which are story, scoring strong on the, the degree to which demonstrate the clear targets and ambitions beyond medium debt renovation and how well they're aligning their plans with long-term renovation strategies. In terms of financing, uh, we found two countries which scored strong uh, for their uh, act activity across the financing landscape. So combining sources of finance uh, and leveraging private private capital as well. In terms of multiple the multiple benefits that plans realize, pretty much across across the board, uh, countries have recognized the energy poverty, um, but they aren't always targeted. Uh, measures aren't always targeted explicitly at supporting every, every energy poverty uh, alleviation. The two areas where we found significant room for improvement are heat decarbonization and the digitalization, which we found are underexplored, underexplored and the links between them and energy renovation aren't always so clear, at least looking at the plans themselves. And then finally, when it comes to public sector, uh, a lot of the a lot of the measures which are proposed aim to address multiple multiple benefits. So, be it accessibility or adaptation, support, supporting the use of sustainable materials, and so on. The area where we saw again quite a bit of room for further activity is around technical skills and assistance, uh, which in which nine out of the 18 countries we studied didn't address or did not invest in, in any of those. And finally, when it comes to the to the implementation framework, uh, the majority have very the majority of countries we study have very clear institutional setup and responsibilities, uh, but don't always have very clear targets in terms of what the energy savings measures are expected to deliver. So moving on to the next slide, please. So um, our, this is the table which summarizes our overall assessment. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, we have we have divided uh, the scores into transformational, strong needs improvement, and not addressed. And these are all the all the countries. Um, so what we see across the board is that there is strong basis for progress. However, most countries score in the area of needs improvement, which means they they have made proactive and positive steps. Uh, to move on across the across the board on all criteria, but there are further further room for improvement. Uh, the area specifically where we saw uh, very, I, I guess, where we saw the least activity is supply chain project support, which is the fourth column, as you can see. I won't go into detail uh, on the specific countries here. I can answer uh, questions later on. We can get back to this. Um, but yeah, so at this stage, we're seeing, as I said. Uh, a lot of pro a, lo a lot of areas uh, where there is a room for improvement, but also very positive steps. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. Speaking of the of the good practices, so I, uh, we across the board we also saw examples of very creative and, and good and best practices uh, for all of the criteria. So in terms of targets, we, there are uh, multiple countries which explicitly go beyond the, beyond the requirements to realize 30% energy savings. One example is Belgium and the Brussels region, for which social housing is expected to deliver at least 53% primary energy savings. Um, there is also, in Ireland, the public sector is, uh, it has clear target of realizing at least 50% energy savings. And there are other examples which we're going to hear about uh, from the our presentations in, in a minute. In terms of the uh, financing, again, good examples across the board. So Germany has very 
um, interesting ways of combining national funding and, 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 the national, and uh, recovery funding. And then in Italy, there are examples where programs have been changed so that banks and uh, energy, service, energy service companies can participate um, now to leverage additional, additional capital. In terms of multiple benefits, uh, we're seeing, again, multiple examples across the board. So in the Czech Republic, the programs, energy renovation programs, very clearly target also adaptation and indoor environment improvements and the use of sustainable materials. Uh, Romania is the only example we saw of, of proactive, uh, proactive measure to encourage the digitalization of, uh, in, within the building sector. So national digitalization building register is being proposed as well as building renovation passports and logbooks. Um, and Spain is one of the examples where, where innovation is used for to support wider social policy, including regeneration and demographic challenges, which I'm sure we're going to hear about as well a bit later on. Um, and one of the very good examples we saw of, um, of technical assistance is Croatia, in which one-stop shops are supported, will be supported according to the plan, and they will be combining energy efficiency and post-earthquake uh, reconstruction, thereby increasing the reach of policies. Uh, so moving to the next slide, please. Uh, the, so the, based on the study so far, and there is a lot more detail in the, in the report, I, uh, we came up with nine key recommendations, which we think are, if implemented, would be very would be key to make the plans transformational. So they're split again across the across the five assessment criteria. I won't go in all of them in detail, uh, but I'll try and cover them quickly. So for clarity and depth of ambition, uh, one of the we have two recommendations. One of them is around prioritizing deep renovation uh, in the design and implementation of the schemes, uh, and the other one is around um, supporting building renovation roadmaps and passports, which would allow the the which would allow renovation to to be because sorry sorry. <laughs> um, so the second one is uh, around the Re, uh, supporting renovation renovation roadmaps for uh, projects which don't deliver deep renovation at once but can deliver stage deep renovation instead. For the financial perspective, as I said, uh, the key recommendation is around crowding in private finance um, and supporting the longevity of the schemes, of the schemes, making sure that they go beyond uh, the financing period till 2026. Uh, for the multiple benefits and integration, we have two recommendations. One of them is around making sure that energy efficiency first principle is consistently applied and that, uh, and that energy renovation and heat decarbonization really go hand in hand. Um, and the second one is around embedding renovation with our uh, political and national priorities. On the supply chain and project support, uh, three key recommendations, strengthening technical assistance at regional and local level, supporting one-stop shops and supporting the upskilling of the workforce uh, because uh, they're uh, those areas where we currently don't see significant funding allocated. And finally, around the implementation, better monitoring and aggregation of the data uh, is the other key recommendation. I can go in, in detail with any of them in the question session. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, and the next one. <laughs> So uh, what next, as Adrian highlighted, there is a significant policy uh, policy changes happening at the moment. Um, what we're seeing is that there is significant investment on the ground. Countries have allocated a lot of funding to support renovation. Um, and if the, if, if the enabling conditions to scale this renovation are supported, that would be helpful to build a stronger fit for fit for 55 package. So I think with, with the legislation and with the investment on the ground, you can create a, a cycle of which uh, deeper renovations are delivered at scale and continuously. So uh, there is an opportunity in the next year as the policy process uh, continues around the, uh, the EPBD and EED directives for a rapid increase of rate and depth of renovation and making buildings future-proof. Um, there is also significant room for uh, leveraging more the digitalization of the building stock and making sure that uh, smart and efficient heating and cooling are integrated well with energy uh, efficiency improvements. And finally, there is room for, uh, for activities to support the acceleration of wider, wider transformation 
including around skills and technical assistance, making sure buildings deliver uh, what they can for our uh, green transition. So I think I'll stop here um, so we have enough time for questions and answers. Vilaslava, thank you so much for that very clear presentation of what is really a comprehensive uh, study that you've carried out for us and uh, with our national partners. Um, maybe, and I see, I'm delighted to see some questions are, are coming in on the Q&A, so I would like uh, the audience to continue asking. Um, and before we move on to the next little part, I just had maybe one quick question. Uh, unless I missed it, you didn't say what the individual country profiles contain. Uh, because we've done a country profile for the 18 member states. Maybe that would be interesting. Oh, yeah. Yes, sorry, I did miss that. So we have created a, a one, one summary report and 18 individual uh, country profiles, which contain deep dives into, into the, all of the assessment criteria for each of the countries, uh, provides detail of, of what the situation is within the country, what's funded, what's supported, and some of the key recommendations for which are country specific uh, rather than the generic ones we just presented, which were based on the aggregate assessment of the countries. So the significant more detail in each of the country profiles, uh, which goes into, into the specific situation within the country. Which allows me to say to uh, the audience that you'll have seen there are four handouts uh, that are uploaded already uh, on the platform. The agenda, the speakers' profiles, uh, the full study with the 18 um, national profiles, and uh, an infographic on the nine recommendations. So please go ahead and uh, download those during the event. Also, we've put the links on our website live, so you can go to the website as well. So as I said a moment ago, thank you, uh, uh, Vilislava, and thank you to the audience for starting to ask questions. They're more for the panel than clar clarifying questions. So before we go on to take the reactions and inputs from uh, the member state representations, we have collected already some reactions to the study from our national partners, and we've uh, compiled it in a short video. So can we have that now, please, uh, Aphrodite? national partner of Anyway Europe coincided with the beginning of the realization of the idea for the National Recovery Plan. During the preparation, the constant contact with all the partners was very fruitful. We are sure the experience and the contacts will be extremely helpful during the implementation of the recovery plan. Mm -hmm. Polish uh, National Recovery and Resilience Plan, we in Fala Renovacji wish that it would be a practical document uh, implementing the energy efficiency first principle in Poland. The Slovak recovery plan is quite ambitious. Uh, there is around 2 billion investment into buildings, both the family houses and the public buildings. And I have to say that the plans and the ambitions are really good, but uh, what will really be the key, whether it will become a success or not, is the proper implementation. So this is exactly what the ministries and implementation body now has to be working on. Spain, um, the recovery funds uh, may be a game changer or maybe not, but the situation is ripe and the conditions are there so that uh, it happens. Uh, the citizens are al already paying attention to renovation. Um, this support uh, may have the right size and all we need now is to find balance between very many things. So that is going to need a lot of coordination and support and facilitation, obviously, but uh, we're here for that. Thank you. I think in Romania it's uh, essential, you know, for a good implementation of national recovery and resilience plan to organize um, a 
working group or at least to to make transparent you know the system of uh, how to implement the programs that will be financed through this uh, national recovery and resilience plan because now we have the objectives we know the budgets allocated but and the principles but we don't know what is behind of uh, of those uh, words So thank you to our partners for uh, sending those reactions in. And uh, Bilislav, in the meantime, a question has come in for clarification. I think we could take it now, which is, could you share information on the per capita allocations uh, for renovation? Uh, yes, there. Uh, sorry, there. We, we did the report. There is a there is one of the one of the charts details that for each of the for each of the countries. Um, so I don't have them on on top of my head, but it is within the within the final report. If I remember correctly, Vilislava, the low is just eleven euros per capita uh, in yes. Austria, and the high is somewhere over three hundred and fifty per capita in Greece. So it's a huge that's, range. It is a huge range. That's correct. And uh, there are a few countries. I have it now in front of me. A few countries are between twenty, with between thirty and forty uh, euro per person. So Denmark, Ireland, Germany, Slovenia, and then there are a, a few others which are around one hundred and twenty to one hundred and forty, for instance, like Latvia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Spain. Uh, but for each of them, the detailed table shows the shows the actual numbers. Great. Okay. So, as I see, we don't have other questions coming in for the moment. Uh, Vilaslava, I let you go, uh, at least into the background. Please stay online uh, so that we can now turn over to the first reactions and inputs from our three uh, member states. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce uh, Irene Chris Selendic from uh, Croatia. She's head of sector for energy efficiency in buildings at the Croatian Ministry of Physical Planning, Construction and State Assets. And I think we'll have been pleased to see the assessment uh, and the chart because Croatia had two out of five uh, uh, criteria as transformational. Mm -hmm. But Irena, I know that you have uh, a PowerPoint, so I hand over to you uh, um, for about 10 minutes. So hello from Croatia, from Zagreb. I have read Renovation Recovery Study with great interest. And I would like to congratulate to all those who have participated in it. We are glad to see that many member states have took this opportunity to use their national recovery and resilience plans to accelerate energy renovation of buildings. We are also glad that Croatia is recognized as an example of good practice for several recommendations to the member states. So now, I will ask to put my presentation on. Next slide, please. So under Croatian Recovery and Resilience Plan, we have 9.9 .9 billion euros, of which 6.3 are grants. Next, please. We have five components and one flagship initiative, Building Renovation. This initiative has 12% share of whole plan, uh, about seven, 770 million euros. Next, please. I would like to point out that Croatia is in a specific situation because due to the recent extremely strong earthquakes, in addition to energy renovation, we, we must also carry out seismic retrofitting. About 30% of the total existing building stock belongs to the category of buildings which are the worst energy properties and structural properties. And it's necessary to carry out structural renovation parallel to the energy renovation. Unfortunately, such renovations are very expensive, but they are necessary because energy renovation without constructive makes no sense. In the next time frame, in accordance with creation long-term renovation strategy, 
a deep and, incompre and comprehensive renovation of buildings will be especially supported. National energy renovation programs will encourage the use of highly efficient renewable energy systems and special attention will be paid to ensuring healthy indoor climate, fire safety and seismic stability. Next slide, please. The most important criteria is a reduction in heating energy for 50% on annual basis for every single building and 30% in primary energy on the level of the component, at least 30%. We have a lower criteria only for cultural heritage buildings, but the request for reduction of 30% primary energy on the whole component level stays the same. Next, please. <clears throat> renovation of buildings initiative has three components. First one is energy renovation of buildings with the allocation of 133 million euros. Second is a reconstruction of earthquake damaged buildings with energy renovation, allocation of almost 600 million euros. And third, energy renovation of buildings with the status of cultural property alloc and allocation is about 40 million euros. Next, please. So for higher savings, we are providing higher grant rate. For 50% savings in heating energy, granting 60%. And for deep renovation, which is in Croatia defined as 50% savings in heating energy plus 50% savings in primary energy at least, the grant is 80%. Also for comprehensive renovation, which includes energy efficiency measures for 50% savings in annual heating energy plus measures for healthy indoor climate, plus fire protection, plus seismic retrofitting, grant is also 80%. Next, please. So uh, here, here you can see all the reforms and investments that we plan in our recovery plan. So it's like developing a framework for ensuring adequate skills in the context of green jobs, increasing efficiency and, dig and digitalization of the renovation process, modernization of seismic data, introduction of a new model of green urban renewal strategies, and a pilot project for the development of green infrastructure and the circular management of buildings and spaces, uh, pilot projects uh, for implementation of systematic management energy in multi-apartment buildings, and so on. Next, please. We face many challenges in energy renovation of buildings. First of all, is a very expensive seismic retrofit. Then weak financial capacity of building owners, large number of low income citizens, big depths of citizens. A constant price growth due to increased need for workers, materials and services. We have shortage of qualified workforce and building companies because many Croatian workers moved to Germany or other countries due to the higher wages. Croatia has introduced quotas for the employment of foreign workers and currently workers from India, Nepal and similar countries works in Croatia. We are counting on the building companies for neighboring countries too. As you can see on the one of the last slides, one of the reforms in our recovery and resilience plan is developing a framework for ensuring adequate skills in the context of green jobs needed for post-earthquake reconstruction, which allocation is about 5.3 million euros. A slide next, please. Uh, funding is always a big topic. Due to the already mentioned earthquakes, Croatia has to invest large funds into the emergency removal of dangerously damaged buildings, temporary accommodations of citizens, emergency rehabilitation and so on, all during the pandemic period. Uh, in the next period, both national and European solid funds uh, are used and will be used. We are currently developing energy renovation programs for buildings by 
2030. You can see all the programs on this slide. And for the first three years of implementation, from 2020 to 2024, we anticipate the use of funds from the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. From 25, uh, financing from national funds and other EU funds is planned, such as the so Social Fund for Climate Policy, the multi-annual financial framework for the period 2021-2027, the Croatian Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and Croatian Environmental Protection and Energy Efficiency Fund. Thank you for now. Thank you, Livia. Uh, sorry, thank you very much, Irena, for that uh, presentation and for jumping into a bit of the detail because I find this interesting. Um, uh, the audience should know that they will find uh, information on the detail that you showed in the table, also in the annex to the country report, uh, where we have extracted uh, what the programs are, the timeline, the volume of money going to the different programs. And I'm encouraged to see that, uh, you know, we, we seem to have got it right. <laughs> so uh, if you can stay with us uh, for the next uh, presentations, Irena, and then we'll come back maybe with some further questions. Okay. Because now it's time for me to introduce our second ministry speaker. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Hugo Lucas, who is the advisor to the general directorate at the Institute for Energy Diversification and Saving. Uh, of the Spanish Ministry for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge. Uh, Hugo, we look forward to hearing your reaction to our study and maybe to some insights on particularly Spanish aspects. Over to you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Renovate European Campaign for the invitation to the Spanish government uh, to present uh, our opinion on, on, on the study and a little more in detail some of the policies that we are including in our national recovery plan. Also, of course, to wish you a happy 10th anniversary and to congratulate you for the study Renovate to Recover. I mean, in policy making, you have to take uh, informed decisions and to take these informed decisions, you need knowledge products. So we very much welcome uh, this study because now they are going to be allocated an unprecedented amount of money and uh, we need these uh, best practices uh, because it comes in the right time now when we are going from policy to concrete support schemes and the designs and implementation of uh, particular or specific support schemes on energy efficiency buildings. Um, these guidelines, these best practices are pretty, are pretty, very, pretty much uh, welcome. Uh, first, I would like to give you some general remarks on the Spanish recovery plan. The recovery plan is what we call a country project. It's a transformation and modernization of our economy and productive sectors that will allow us to achieve greater resilience to future economic shocks and uncertainty scenarios. Another important thing also mentioned, I think, in the introduction, this is happening uh, not from the scratch. I mean, as uh, as you know, within the framework of the European uh, Union, um, all the countries, we have worked already on our national energy and climate plans. There were already the implementation of the different energy efficiency uh, directives. There is also the long-term strategy for decarbonization. In our, in our case, also in the last month, it was the approval of the energy transition climate change law. And so we have uh, past strategies on energy poverty. Now we come back to this uh, later on, circular economy or the infrastructure, which all these are related uh, to energy efficiency. Particularly as we take into consideration the policy from the European Union of having energy efficiency first. The recovery plan envisages the mobilization of more of 140 billion euros in public investment until 2026, with a significant concentration of the investments and reform in the first period of the next generation plan, so the period from 2021 to 2023, in order to boost recovery and achieve the greatest possible impacts. The recovery plan delivers a clear and unquestionable message in Spanish economic recovery will be green. The ecological transition is configured as one of the backbone of the response for the Spanish recovery 
and 40% of all the investment has the green tag uh, in this renewal, in this recovery plan. The recovery plan, in the case of Spain, contains 30 components, and now I would like to go more into details of the component related with housing rehabilitation. In line with the renovation wave, this component has a double objective. On, one, on the one hand, to activate a rehabilitation sector in Spain that allows decarbonizing and improving the quality and comfort of the buildings. On the other, to promote the construction of social rental housing stock that is currently insufficient and is urgently needed to respond to the needs of decent and affordable housing of the most vulnerable population. The Spanish building sector currently consumes 30% of the final energy, and there is a still an important share of buildings that have no heating and cooling equipment. Likewise, there is a significant potential for energy saving and renewable energies in buildings. The housing renovation component in the recovery plan is committed with energy efficiency, also with the integration of renewable energy sources and the improvement of digitalization. But, but in addition to the population living in metropolitan areas, other populations such as the rural must also be taken into account. Specific measures on energy transition has been designed for rural areas in Spain in the recovery plan. As mentioned before, we are also the Ministry for the Demographic Challenge. In this context, um, I would like now to provide you more details of a new support scheme for building renovations in towns under 5,000 inhabitants. This support scheme is called PRE 5000. In Spain, there are 6,800 municipalities under 5,000 inhabitants, concentrating 5.7 million people, 12% of the total population. These municipalities have lost 410,000 people in the last 10 years. Low energy performance and lack of heating or cooling uh, installation or equipment are more accurate problems in these small municipalities. The objective of the PREP 5000 is to give a boost to the sustainability of the buildings in this municipality, providing subsidies to improving the thermal envelope up to 50% of financial support, replacement of fossil fuel thermal generation for renewable energy sources such as biomass, geothermal, solar. This, will, this action will have up to 40% financial subsidy. Deployment of monitoring and control technologies, 20% financial support, and improvement in energy efficiency in lighting, 20% of financial support. In addition, the program pre has also two more strategic principles. Is the first one is to increase efforts to eradicate energy poverty, but also to support the deployment of local energy communities. In line with the national strategy against energy poverty, additional financial support is granted for action carried out in residential buildings owned by vulnerable population. But the program is also designed to promote ambition. Likewise, those actions that raise the energy rating of buildings to obtain a class A or B will be entitled to a 10% additional aid for improving the energy efficiency. In addition, actions that simultaneously combine two or more typologies will be entitled for additional financial support. The initial budget of the PRE 5000 is 50 million euros. Nevertheless, regions that run out of budget can come back and ask for more uh, money up to or until December 2023 when the programs will end. So to conclude, I will want, would like also once again uh, to thank Renovate European Campaign for the invitation to speak in this forum and for this report. And since energy policy is a learning by doing process, I would like to encourage also to do a continuous monitoring and assessment of the different schemes that we all countries have uh, stated in our recovery plan and also to continue to provide us with fora like this uh, to discuss some best practices thank you very much and thank you hugo for that very uh, wonderful insight to what's happening in spain uh, the uh, the program aimed at uh, small communities sounds like a very innovative one and one that could have really wide benefits across all of society uh, truly sounds like a good practice case to uh, publicize more uh, for other countries. 
So, uh, Hugo, if there are questions, we'll come back. Uh, we will have a Q&A with the various uh, presenters in about uh, 20 minutes. So I hope you can hold on with us. Because now it's my uh, pleasure to invite uh, Livia Vasakova from Slovakia uh, to join us. Uh, she is an advisor to the Prime Minister and Director General of the Recovery Plan section of the Government Office of the Slovak uh, Republic. Livia, um, maybe you could put your camera on and uh, take about eight to ten minutes for an intervention with your reaction to the study and what's happening in Slovakia. Are you there, Livia? I don't, I see you in the panel, but I don't see that the camera is on. I don't see the microphone. Looks like it's muted. Livia? No, I'm not getting any action there. Um, maybe we'll come back to Livia uh, after our next uh, present presenter. Maybe we can iron out the technical issues uh, in the meantime. So I hope we can get that sorted. So let's move on because we have also a presentation on how to leverage private finance. Uh, from uh, James Hooten. James is the Programme Director at the Green Finance Institute. Uh, he'll tell us a little about it now and indeed has a, a presentation of PowerPoint to share with us. James, you have about 10 minutes. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks for, thanks so much for inviting me. Congratulations on your, uh, on your anniversary. And, um, and also your very impactful report with uh, yourselves, your team, your national partners, and, uh, and E3G as well. Um, so just onto my first slide, please. Thank you. So I think we've talked about it. One of the recommendations from the study is the, the need to unlock private capital. And I think this slide just demonstrates that sort of inescapable fact. Three and a half trillion euros is the estimate about in terms of the sum of what's being spent already, plus the gap that needs to be spent on Europeans on um, the EU's 220 million buildings over this decade. The, the 296 billion there is, a, is an unrealistic assumption I made in terms of if every member state allocated 37% of green spending to building renovation. So that's, that's just there as an illustrative point. Um, and to balance the equation, obviously there's private capital, but we shouldn't forget about the benefits as well, and the benefits in terms of job creation, healthcare, reduction in healthcare costs, and social savings that are, that are just as important, if not very important. Next slide, please. But it's it's just not about it's not about just the financial sector. There are three key components that we see for systemic change: enabling policy environment. So we need a policy ambition that's backed up by enabling long-term legislation. And that's enabling because, and it needs to be long-term and patient because that's something that then the supply chain can invest into and prepare themselves for. And that supply chain, which is represented here in terms of technical assistance, means we have to set up a quality assured, accredited national supply chain. As we know, currently at the moment, we're seeing issues with that. We need consumer awareness, we need people to understand exactly what's available to, to them, legal and academic advice. We need NGOs, policy think tanks, et cetera. We need everyone around the table, including the financial innovation as well. The financial innovation, which we'll, we'll touch on shortly, um, there's not one particular product, there's not one particular uh, answer that will solve for the different climactic, geographical or economic diversity that we see across the EU. So we'll need these three key components to come together to answer this question. Uh, next slide, please. So, so this is really about moving from the what to the how. You know, how do we bring public, private finance, philanthropic capital to co-design the solutions that will enable us to mobilize capital at the pace and scale needed in the real economy? And the Green Finance Institute, we're big believers in, in these public-private partnerships and in coalitions that can catalyze financial innovation. So these coalitions 
of which we, we appreciate absolutely some exist across the European Union at the moment. We're absolutely outcomes focused here. So what are the financial products? What are the data enablers that are going to overcome the existing barriers? And typically they're split into two sections. The first off is to let's identify those barriers. This what's the sectorial review across owner occupied, across the private rental sector, across social housing. What are the barriers that are stopping investment into renovation? And then secondly, splitting the teams up into working groups to actually design those products, design the demonstrator projects that will look to unlock uh, and create the, the flow of capital into, into the renovation. Next slide, please. So the next two slides just will touch on some of the, the ideas, some of the concepts that are in, in play at the moment. And I think it's here, it's really key again, it's the systemic change. And this is about, on this slide here, is about creating demand certainty, that, as I talked about, that the supply chain can invest into. And really, yeah, I think how people talk about this is around having legis legislative carrots and sticks. And so, for instance, on here, you can see some sticks, potentially, some mortgage portfolio standards, um, minimum energy performance standards, uh, around you know, particular standards for, for housing to meet. So making the government legislate that. But they can also go hand in hand with, with carrots as we talk about it. So for instance, uh, the, the Green Building Council has proposed a property purchase tax rebate. Um, so for consumers, when they buy their house, if they perform a renovation within the first two years of ownership, they'll get a rebate back from the government on the tax initially paid. Interestingly. A, the, the rebate isn't enough to pay for the entire renovation. Um, it's really a nudge. It's a trigger to say, I'm buying, I'm making one of the, the biggest investments of my life. Um, what, what am I tying myself into from an energy performance perspective? Um, and also the, the, the proposal is designed to be revenue neutral to the treasury. Um, so it's a sort of a win-win, but the key here is your supply is generating the demand. There are key trigger points within the life cycle of a property, whereby it can now get renovated. Uh, onto the next slide, please. So this is some of the specific outcomes of the, the Coalition for the Energy Efficiency of Buildings um, from the private side, from the demand side. And again, so we're looking here at data enablers and then particular financial products. And I think one of the key points to make for this slide is that actually not all of the ideas are new um, and you I'm sure many of you will see ideas here and, and concepts here that are in discussion in your countries or even internationally and I think the point to make is that the coalition is able to sit down and work out the fact that these products are replicable um, but how do you adjust them to your local conditions and one of the key things that we're very focused on is combining and bringing these things together. So for instance, from a building renovation passports that we, we rolled out recently, how do you combine that with a mortgage lender, for instance, that's issuing green mortgages? Uh, and, and now we do have in the UK at the moment, mortgage lenders that will tie a new issuance of a mortgage to a, an energy survey, to a building renovation passport, to create that A, the awareness of the property you're buying, but to create that long-term demand to know how do you tie in what the building property renovation looks like over the course of the next five to 10 years? How do you do that? And what does the funding, the financing look like? And there are also financial products as well that uh, are either in, in, in chain at the moment or they're, they're, in, they're out in the world, uh, in the UK certainly, and, and in other, in other countries. Green rental agreements, uh, which are about splitting the cost of rental property renovation. One of the the key issues discussed is around split incentives, and this aims to share equitably the, the capital uh, and then the operational expense or the reduction in operational expense of a, of a building renovation. How do you split that between the landlord and the tenant, particularly in a, in a cold rent scenario? Uh, Property-linked finance, uh, renovation liability, which is tied to the property. So in the UK, that would take a second lien behind behind the mortgage and we're just trying to work out at the moment how that actually works. I know this has happened in 
EU countries as has happened in the US and Australia. So we're trying to work out how to link this. But again, this is in the able to pay market. How do you make sure that people are able to renovate their property and not worry about selling that in the short term and being left with a capital outlay that they're not going to recoup? And lastly on here, local climate bonds, which are a very innovative way of actually of getting regional authorities accessing a separate funding stream from their local communities for green projects. It's similar to, to crowdfunding, but it gives people in their local communities place-based ideas of exactly what's happening uh, with solar panels, whatever it might be, greening a local environment. Um, but it's a really good way of tying people in in a local community into the into the revolution. Next slide, please. So just finally, I'll just finish on this. The time is now. You know, the next generation EU funding ends in 2026. The opportunity is now to use this public capital to crowd in private finance. Uh, and there are, you know, for us, from our perspective, the way to do that is to get everyone around the table and co-design the solutions. Uh, and I know there are Horizon 2020 and uh, Innovate EU coalitions out there. Adrian, you're, you're, some of your partners have been discussing on videos implementation. And so we're actively, uh, we've been reviewing those countries and those partners with E3G. And we're keen to partner with those around implementation in, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, James, for that very stimulating presentation on financing. And indeed, I've no doubt that it's of great interest to the audience to have heard uh, these ideas, uh, which you've put together in, in a very uh, comprehensive way. Indeed, that kind of uh, coalition and cooperation is, is precisely what our national partners have become over the years. And uh, financing has always been one of the key issues that they, they face. Maybe they are key uh, starters for these coalitions. And I've been asking myself the question, um, should we do a quick uh, analysis and see where there's an overlap between the countries that seem to have put the right measures in place with their recovery plans and the kind of characteristics I know that you at the Green Finance Institute have identified as countries that are ripe for the kind of coalitions that you spoke about towards the end. And indeed, uh, there are other initiatives that we're aware of have, that have looked at this kind of mapping. So I think there's, it, you say the time is now, uh, I agree 100%, and pulling together all of these uh, initiatives to create coherence uh, would be quite a wonderful thing to do. Mm. I had a last comment I wanted to make myself, uh, maybe I'll let you back in, but I really liked your characterization that long-term money must be patient because patience uh, is a real virtue that I, I, I know our sector uh, deserves. Did you want to maybe react? No, I think that's absolutely right, Adrian. I, I, won't, I won't repeat. I think there are, um, you know, I think we're, we, we, we've, worked, we've been working in the UK and we, we feel like this is replicable, but we also know that there are partners that are doing this or um, potentially struggling with this. And I, and I feel that we can struggle together. Um, and, and there are answers out there. And I think there are the right people to bring in, and uh, particularly with the public funding. And I think particularly the, the, the next generation EU funding is not only just capital expenditure, it can be operational expenditure as well. And that for me is the key about, you don't have to find a massive project to spend this money on. I mean, you can use it to create teams to help you do that, the technical assistance piece is possible. Okay, great. So I have to announce that we're having trouble uh, connecting with our Slovak colleague uh, at the ministry. So what I would like to do is ask uh, Irene and Hugo to turn back on their cameras and um, I'll animate a quick exchange on what we've heard so far. And please, to the audience, uh, delighted if you could uh, put questions in the Q questions box. Um, uh, that would help to uh, feed the discussion that we're about to have. But let me come back first to Irena, uh, because I have a question uh, that I noticed from the NRRP. Um, awareness, as you said, for the need for deeper energy renovation has grown in recent years. And I saw that those who go for higher ambition in Croatia will get a higher proportion of grant. Uh, this is obviously to encourage that. Uh, so the realization is there in Croatia. But you also have a unique experience in using energy performance contracting. And I wondered, could you comment on whether energy performance contracting 
um, is a suitable instrument for achieving deep renovation? Is it something, is it a model going forward that you might integrate into the programs that you're uh, putting forward for public buildings, for example? So, Croatia has successfully implemented the ESCO model, which has proven to be the best model in the renovation of public buildings, owned and used by the central government, with 70 buildings being renovated. The average savings were around 52%, and share of renewable energy uh, was about 20%. I will name only a few projects, uh, clinical hospital center in Split, Šibeni, Karlovac, kindergarten in Tres, sports center, Poljud in Split, uh, Zagreb, prison, hospital, University North in Varaždin and policy academy in Zagreb. So Croatia is recognized uh, for its successful ESCO model and it, I would like to announce that it will be implemented again in the coming period. According to the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, private capital will be used on the basis of energy performance contracting in the amount of 60% and 40% of the investments will be financed by the grants from uh, Recovery and Resilience Plan and 250 million kunas allocated for this purpose and purpose is uh, renovation of public building sector. So we already implemented this in our recovery and resilience plan. Okay, Irina, I think that's a very interesting experience. And uh, I mean, I have no doubt that other countries would, would maybe like to learn from that experience. Um, Hugo, turning over to the Spanish uh, um, context, you mentioned a couple of times the idea of affordability and eradicating energy poverty. It seemed to us as well that this was a real pillar of the NRRP. Is, is the recovery money coming to boost existing uh, measures and schemes or will this be a fresh uh, program that's coming forward in Spain on energy poverty specifically? Okay, thank you very much for the questions. Um, well, I mean, I think we are all aware of the situation that we are going uh, through now with the prices of uh, energy. No? So on this vulnerability uh, discussion is even more important uh, at this moment. Uh, since uh, 2018, when we approved our national strategy for energy poverty, we have, have implemented uh, different measures uh, to provide support uh, to vulnerable people. Um, the, the, the most well-known uh, are the electricity and heating bonus, so it's really uh, a minimum of consumption that they will not have to pay. But with this, we also have already identified which are these vulnerable consumers, who are this vulnerable population. So the goal now is when you are drafting other measures, uh, like the program I explained, the 5,000 rehabilitation energy in buildings with, in municipality of less than 5,000 people, then uh, these uh, vulnerable people will have uh, will be topped with an extra aid. You know? So once you have already identified which households are vulnerable, what you can do when you design the other programs or what we are um, mainly doing is for these vulnerable people, increase uh, increase the support, and sometimes going to support the 100 percent. No, um, and in addition, also um, we have a specific uh, support for vulnerables when we have to apply mandatory regulation from the European Union. So, uh, for instance, when you have the meters and uh, homes. No, buildings that have uh, central heating and now everybody has to put meters at home coming from the uh, energy efficiency and buildings directive. So this is an expense uh, for consumers. So if you are identified as vulnerable, there is uh, uh, there, there has been designed and will be implemented a program to support this expense and vulnerable people. We don't have to uh, we don't have to invest money or spend money in this particular uh, action that is mandatory uh, for the for the regulation. 
So I think, unfortunately, because of the situation we have increased in policy and mechanisms for vulnerable in the last three years, this is uh, today more important. And we have both approaches for specific, uh, and particularly mandatory uh, actions that they will have 100% full support. And for the voluntary actions, uh, it will be uh, top up to the system one. Okay, thank you, Hugo. That's uh, really uh, informative for us to hear uh, what's happening. Um, I see that the audience is being active like I asked them to be. And I see a question, James, that I think you, you're ideally placed to answer. Um, it's from Alan Chapman. He says, as an alternative to private finance, would it be better for the EU to provide sufficient funds by printing more money to provide interest-free loans for building owners to repay capital from energy savings? What do you think? I think that I'm not entirely sure if the EU has the capacity over the next 10 years to take on that certain amount of debt. I think that is absolutely, as I said, is a smorgasbord, if I can use the word expression, of um, products that are, that are needed. I think there are, there are people in the able to pay market um, that are actually you know, there that will use their own capital. I think the 0% low interest loan over 30 years has its place, definitely doesn't, particularly around uh, those in the energy poverty, energy vulnerable um, perspective. I don't think that the, the entirety of the challenge will be met that way. Uh, and there are people within the able to pay bracket that need to put their own capital to um, to use. So in other words, really, we need it all. We need every kind of money we can get our hands on because the volume of the challenge is so great. Yes, yeah, exactly. perfect. Yeah, yeah, okay. Vilislava, uh, I know you're still there. Maybe you might just join the panel because I see uh, a question from Pierre Crouveillet that I think you're uh, best placed to answer. It, it reads, the study mentions renovation co-benefits. Do they cover also health in buildings, such as indoor air quality? Uh, he says the health dimension was not explicitly mentioned. Um, what do you think, Bilislava? What did you find in the plans on the health dimension? Thanks, that's a, that's a really good question. So we did see a few plans which prioritize that. So I think the uh, from memory, uh, I think the Czech plan explicitly addresses improvement in air quality, for instance, in the renovation of schools. Uh, there are other plans, I think Hungary, Hungary and Bulgaria, which have prioritized investment in, uh, for instance, infrastructure, health infrastructure, rather than kind of general improvement in health. So definitely countries are thinking about realizing some of those, uh, some of those uh, additional benefits. Also, there are examples where, for instance, um, equality, gender equality is prioritized by the choice of renovation, uh, for instance, of, of uh, centers for child care and so on. Um, so definitely there is a variety of, of approaches countries have taken and I would encourage people to look into the, into the final report and the individual country profiles as well to get a good sense of them. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. The country profiles are really interesting. It gives you a really good sense of what's happening on the ground. Well, the questions are coming in thick and fast now. Um, I have another question. I think it's more of a general question, uh, maybe uh, for the member state representatives. It reads, that's from Peter Thorns. Um, we always say renovation creates jobs, but if Croatia, uh, he must know this, is short of construction workers as they are working in Germany, etc. So importing workers from other regions, are we, creating a skilled workforce or just moving people around countries? I mean, are skills and workforce numbers an issue in Croatia and Spain, Irena? It's not really for now. We don't have any project which is stopping because lack of the, of the workforce, but it may be in the future. Mm. For now, it's, it's not really. Okay. And we and have uh, the large number of working places in civil engineering in 28, like 15 years ago. And uh, after crisis that hit all the Europe and all the world, we never get back to these numbers. So mm. we really need creating new jobs in Croatia. Okay, and in Spain, Hugo, what's the situation? Yes, definitely. Uh, 
I mean, as I mentioned before, uh, the recovery plan is not uh, designed or drafted from scratch. No, like we have the national strategy for uh, efficiency in buildings, or we have the national plan for for energy and climate. And one of the challenges identified in this paper is uh, qualified human skills. That's clear. And one mm -hmm. of the measures implemented is to pull uh, a multidisciplinary. Uh, a multidisciplinary group of uh, different actors uh, to improve and design existing education and training in, in, in our system. That goes slow, it's not easy, but it's clear that, uh, that uh, it has to be done and it's being done. Um, there are few initiatives within different European Union projects, Horizon projects, uh, with the building sector and the different actors and different ministries. Um, and this uh, will be this, this will be addressed because uh, definitely uh, it's an issue. We have also seen how I was mentioning before. It's not only about energy efficiency. Now it's also integrating renewable energy uh, in buildings and digitalization in buildings. So it's not only the, the skills has to be updated as well. No, it's not the usual builders are not enough. No, you have mm. to also include now this demand uh, for professional highly qualified professional that will also understand how is the integration of more electrification in buildings, uh, more smart in buildings and, and renewable energy in buildings. So definitely uh, this, is a, this is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Hugo. For, there's a question that builds on, on your earlier intervention, Hugo, um, which talks uh, from Céline Carré, uh, talking about the identification of vulnerable consumers. Mm -hmm. Uh, she states that this step is uh, essential in many respects for uh, many actions and for planning and uh, that we need to consolidate with the LTRS uh, to make sure that this uh, quantif identification is properly undertaken it allows for proper planning. Um, so maybe it's more of a comment uh, than, than a full question but she does ask how can we consolidate the long-term innovation strategy to make sure that this uh, quantification or, or identification is properly done and actually I think all panelists might be able to answer that question um, Celine links it to another question I had in mind which is the rollout of minimum energy performance standards something promised in the revision of the buildings directive something we think will be a great driver uh, so maybe any of you could answer that. Maybe James, would you take a shot at this, uh, the, some of these aspects and I'll come across the, the panel. So I, I just picked up the last bit, Adrian, you, if it was me or you've broken up, but the minute, yes, uh, Ministry of Energy Performance Standards, absolutely mm -hmm. supportive of, of those. In the UK, they've been in the, uh, in the private rental sector for I think three years now. Um, and we're under consultation uh, in the owner-occupied sector as well at the moment, um, and it's something that uh, ha have actually there were there were fears around unintended con consequences, um, particularly for um, energy vulnerable populations which have not been realised to the fullest extent. So um, we are certainly, I think it was on, on my presentation um, previously, as a, as a legislative legis demand driver, we think it's absolutely the right thing to go and creates that maybe to go back to the previous question about um, the supply chain. If you have, if you look at the Green Homes Grant, uh, which was a, in the end not a great thing, but at the beginning of that, you saw supply chain actors starting to invest and create and bring jobs to for that expected demand. So if you put, put that um, performance standard in law, supply chain actors will invest into that. Okay, welcome, Sean. I see you there uh, a little early, so you could you can you can stay on if you wish, or put the camera off for a few minutes. We'll come to you shortly. Um, Irena, did you want to come in on this question of identification and the the link to LTRS and what your view on minimum energy performance standards are? Are they going to be a useful tool? I don't know. <laughs> we are waiting for the proposal from Commission. Because, as I said, we have two problems, uh, seismic retrofitting and energy retrofitting at the same time. And the poorest people are living in these buildings. So what problem is here if they don't have money 
to retrofit their home, they are going to lose it a lot. So this is a real problem in Croatia. You have to put great amount of money uh, to raise seismic and constructive parts of the building. And after that, you have to do energy renovation. So this is a really, mm -hmm. really big challenge in Croatia. Miroslava, you wanted to come in on this topic. It was on the previous one, but yeah, on this one uh, also, uh, I think, I, uh, so what, I think what the question refers to is the uh, assessment criteria of kind of wanting quantification around some of those, uh, some of those criteria. I think the point to make there is it would be really helpful to have uh, integrated reporting and stronger reporting around around uh, energy poverty and and around uh, where innovation is actually realized i think um so that was one of the that, that's why we selected that as a criteria because there is a lot of activities it's delivering lots of benefits um but sometimes linking the data set if that makes sense is extremely challenging so i think it would be there is a case for stronger monitoring um i would say mm -hmm. okay yeah here you go jump in yes yeah, maybe I would like also uh, to address the issue. I think that I understood from the question is how the end how do you reach these people? You know, uh, as I mentioned in my previous intervention, of course we have started um, with people that has already an electricity contract. You know, um, and through the utilities you, uh, they can apply. Um, they have to commit with different criteria. Many of them is with the incomes of this household, but there are other, also other criteria such as all people living or if it's uh, one single uh, parent family so and so but we what we have found also is that many of these people they don't have a bank account so i still have a remaining national budget for two years ago uh, for people that we have identified they they they, um, they they are they are vulnerable uh, but they pay in the window the electricity uh, with cash when they have the money and we are still um, have not able to reach them to transfer the money uh, for subsidies for being vulnerable for any poverty. So, of course, there is still um, a lot of work to do in our case, uh, um, going more into the ground uh, with regions and municipality, working with regions and municipality, because at the national level, sometimes it's very difficult, as mentioned in the question, to reach the vulnerable at the end. No? Mm -hmm. And I mean, on this question of managing, there's there's a question, I'm not going to read that verbatim, but it raises an issue that we haven't covered. And it is really about the role of municipalities or which level uh, is going to be best maybe for implementing all of these very ambitious uh, strategies, uh, the, the plans, uh, absorbing the funding that's available. And maybe as a wrap up for our panel discussion, because I see that our uh, members of the European Parliament have joined us, um, and we're coming up to the time. Maybe this could be used as an opportunity for you to also say a wrap up. Um, I'm going to work across my screen. So the question is, what level could we look to for um, uh, implementation and to manage the rollout uh, on the ground of real impact? And I will just work across my screen. Vilaslava, you happen to be first. Do you have a few words on this and a final wrap up? Thanks, Adrian. Uh, I think probably others are a better place to comment on that. Uh, I think there is a space from what we've seen is countries have taken very different approaches to who actually delivers. And I think there is space for different models. It would really be country dependent. And I think people on the ground are best placed to, to figure out what works in that context. Okay, Hugo. Yeah. I fully agree with the, with, the, with, with the colleagues, no, it depends on uh, each uh, country reality, but we also have in the middle of the regions, no, um, looking to the different uh, the components and the different support schemes, then uh, I think we have, have a very productive discussion on which uh, money should channelize through regions and also working with the municipalities and, and uh, for instance we have seen two clear cases which is of course when you want to renovate public buildings at the municipal level of course and, and as i said before because they do the first aid social assistance trying to work with them in designing and also implementing uh, support skills looking to vulnerable uh, households thank you thank you hugo so irena you're next so in croatia the coordinating body for the whole plan is ministry of finance our Ministry of Construction uh, is in charge for this component, uh, building renovation. 
but then we have many stakeholders here like uh, city of zagreb ministry of culture for cultural heritage buildings uh, faculties national agency many many stakeholders uh, on many levels are involved okay and well coordinated i hope yeah by us yeah. <laughs> good okay and james you have the last word in this panel Thank you. I'm not sure that's deserved. But, um, <laughs> I would say it sounds like Irina has someone that's coordinating it. So for me, maybe just I would say maybe a bit controversially that if the directives can be set and, and there's someone that's going to help like DG Reggio or reform or work with people um, on another set. I want to say the word enforcement, but I don't mean it in that blunt way. But how do you collaborate to make sure that actually these things are actually adhered to? Um, because I think then that's that's very key, but ad ad adhered to at that level, but with coordination of how that actually happens individually on the ground with different departments is, is key. Okay, thank you, James. And thank you to all of the panel, to Villaslava for presenting the study, uh, Hugo from Spain for giving the Spanish perspective, Irina from Croatia, and James uh, from the UK, Green Finance Institute. Very sorry that we didn't have Livia from Slovakia, but we had technical problems and Martin happily an MEP from Slovakia might fill some of the gap uh, in a few moments. Uh, but once again, thank you. Uh, if it was a live conference, I'd call for a round of applause, uh, but uh, we can't do that today. But please stay on, on the line and maybe uh, if, if there's an opportunity, you might even jump back in within the next half hour. So thank you very much indeed. And to the audience, I would say, I hope we've encouraged you to download and read and promote our study and to use it for uh, your own uh, purposes. So now I want to turn to an equally important subject beyond the, the recovery, uh, which is the question about what will the EU legislative framework look like for buildings moving forward? And uh, I think a lot of the audience will know that the key directives, the Energy Efficiency Directive and the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive are both up for revision uh, and recast this year. And uh, there's going to be quite a lot of negotiation around these uh, two directives and the rest of the Fit for 55 uh, package. Um, but I suppose our hope in the Renovate Europe campaign is that the measures to be introduced in these directives will be appropriate to boost the rate and depth of renovation to really put the building sector on the path towards climate neutrality by 2050 meaning highly energy efficient and decarbonized. And so on that note, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome two of our champions from the European Parliament. We have Sean Kelly from Ireland, the EPP group, and we have Martin Hushik from Slovakia, from the Renew group. Both of you well known within the circles of energy efficiency, financing, uh, industrial policy, etc. But Sean, over to you first for uh, a few opening remarks. Uh, can you maybe, uh, you're, you're at the moment the rapporteur for an implementation report on the existing Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Could you share with us what you're finding as you do that uh, report and maybe what it's telling you about what measures should be coming uh, moving forward? Five minutes, Sean. Yeah. Thank you very much, Adrian, and hello, everybody. Yeah, this is a very interesting and exciting topic at this particular time especially as uh, the renovation of the EU building stock is a key component of the Green Deal. And indeed, the opportunity to reduce emissions is massive and will not be done without uh, retrofitting thousands and thousands of buildings across the European Union. There's a goal to renovate 35 million buildings by 2030, supported with a funding of 672.5 billion, and recovery and resilience, resilience facility, and that is a massive economic opportunity which must be grasped. And of course, it's quite clear if we don't grasp it, then the climate targets which we have are not going to be reached. And at the moment, uh, people have to be aware at this stage, and we need to keep repeating it. The buildings are responsible for 36% of greenhouse gas emissions and 40% of energy consumption in the EU. Not enough. Policymakers, businesses, and indeed the public in general are aware of those facts. And if they were, they would take a different and more urgent approach to these houses and buildings we occupy every single day. So there's an opportunity there to reduce emissions. 
and of course also uh, to create millions of jobs. Having said that though, looking at the implementation of the Energy per per Performance of Buildings Directive, the long-term renovation strategies as submitted by the member states are not adequate to do that because uh, some of them lack ambition, others vary in detail, <coughs> and uh, they are often general more than specific. So that was the key finding from us. And one of the recommendations we've been making is that there needs to be a template developed by the Commission, which member states would follow. There's no point in leaving up to each member state to come forward with proposals and the whole lot of them not being uh, interlinked. It is far better, we think, to have a template at the EC level, which would show how the targets can be met, what needs to be done to meet them, and then the financial supports behind it. And then the member states could take those and adapt them to their own particular situation. I think that's hugely important. There's a whole area of uh, unexploited energy efficiency also on buildings. And this must be again highlighted. Many people aren't aware of that. People, Many people living in houses and buildings think they're okay. They think they're better maybe than the house next door or down the street. But there's a huge opportunity which is not being grasped, whereby we can get people thinking about not just reducing emissions, but also saving money in the long term and doing something for the planet. I think there are very few people in Europe at the moment who, if they were asked, would you like to do something to reduce emissions, to save the planet for the next generation, wouldn't answer with an enthusiastic yes. And this is one area they don't think of. They will think of buying an electric car, but they may not think of this. So I think we have to put this before them and also going back to the last point you mentioned Aidan there with your panel, uh, municipalities. There has to be a kind of a target for municipalities as well as national targets and European targets. And that I think would make a big difference as well. So the other point which we want to emphasize is that the energy performance certificates are also inadequate. They have to be uh, actually based on reality, not estimations. So things like comprehensive access day to data is very important, smart metering and real energy performance has to be looked at. So again, the people and uh, consumers, those who are purchasing houses, selling houses, actually will be reflecting the reality of the situation. So all this is very important because it reflects jobs it will, it will affect SMEs, it will affect how we're going to actually uh, meet our carbon targets. And if we don't, we're not going to do it. But it doesn't seem to have the urgency, Adrian, that all other things seem to have. They'll talk about energy efficiency, fine. They'll even talk about renewable energy, yes, all for it. But the practicality of buildings seems to be a little bit further down the line, whereas it should be up on top because it affects everybody's living health and comfort and the reduction of emissions every single day. So that's what we'd be hoping uh, from our report that the Commission will take and then bring back when we do the recast of it, uh, probably in the this year or early next year. So thank you very much, Edwin. And thank you, Sean, for those uh, wise introductory words and for giving us a, a, the scope of the implementation report that you are uh, currently uh, preparing with colleagues at the, at the Parliament. And I might come back on some of the detail, uh, maybe to, 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 to uh, um, incite a little debate. But Martin, over to you. Um, as I said, uh, your colleague, unfortunately, Livia Vasaskova, was not able to uh, join us earlier for technical reasons. I don't know if you want to make a few comments on what you've been able to see of the study we, we, we um, uh, prepared. But in fact, we were looking for your views on these directives, the Buildings Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive. And I'm aware that you're keen on sustainable finance as well. So Martin, five minutes uh, introduction on the, these topics and what, what can we expect coming downstream? What should we? 
be calling for. Thank you, Adrian, and, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I think the the building sector is indeed, and I agree with John, Shane, uh, really, really important uh, on not only our path to carbon neutrality, uh, but also I think it's important in terms of a circular economy. Just yesterday, actually, I was on the workshop with the Bulgarian construction industry looking at the circle side of the, of the buildings, and I think this is something where we always have to keep in mind the, the holistic picture of the challenge so we don't kind of then uh, lose the track of different aspects and end up with uh, the problems. Now, I'm not going to attempt to replace what uh, Livia Vashakova was, was planning to, to say. I looked up at the uh, Slovak, uh, more in depth at the Slovak uh, chapter of, of your report. Uh, to be able to assess as well, I've been in, I've been kind of following and, and commenting on the uh, preparation of the national uh, recovery and resilience plan uh, for actually since the very beginning. Uh, but I'll try to kind of put it into into uh, a bit more across my my contribution uh, because I think the this is not only specific for Slovakia. These are the challenges that we need to uh, address across the entire Europe. What we see actually now, it's a, a situation with the energy prices that it's going to have, I hope, positive impact, despite the, the really a hard situation. I hope that it's going to have a positive impact and uh, show people that we need to really go and address the energy efficiency and energy independence, honestly, because the whole thing is based on uh, the problem with the gas supplies from Russia. It's not like we suddenly consume much more um, in terms of the uh, building sector. Also, uh, what we face is a situation where we again need to emphasize the energy hierarchy. We are uh, having often discussions in the parliament about the transitory, uh, transition role of gas. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use any gas at all, but it should be the last resort. We need to really first start with uh, energy, the use optimization, energy efficiency, renewables, and only then as the very last resort any gas. And I think it's very clear now with the uh, high prices of gas that uh, the less is better. Uh, and not to mention the whole uh, climate aspect. And also, let's be honest, geopolitical security because no one wants to be dependent on uh, autocratic regimes. Now, I think here what we have to also keep in mind is that, and that's one of the challenges, that has been one of the challenges, and we have to keep an eye on it in Slovakia for the future, is we need proper deep renovations. We need renovations that are not just plastering some uh, isolation on the top of a building, on the outside walls of the building. We need proper in-depth legislation. Therefore, I was concerned and I was discussing with the Minister uh, of uh, Transportation and Construction uh, last week in Slovakia, the worrying trend that they want to actually regress on the st energy standards for building. They want to make them actually weaker. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, you know, you have a hard work by civil servants and then, you know, the politicians are doing weird things. Uh, I think this is something which uh, uh, definitely we need to keep an eye on, that we don't have any regression on the standards. I hope this will be averted in Slovakia, but I think this is something which needs to be watched um, in uh, across the entire Union. I think there might be attempts to, to water it down. Second, what is important is uh, that we look at the, not just the supply chain in terms of uh, people being able to deliver. That's one side. But actually, I think it's a challenge and opportunity at the same time for the entire union to look at it from an industrial strategy. We will need all those construction materials, need to figure out how to do them really with uh, as uh, you know, a little embedded carbon as possible and or take it into account when we do the entire calculations. But ultimately, you know, I think for uh, also the economical uh, uh, perspective of and kind of industrial perspective of Europe, one wants to be 
uh, one wants us to be ahead in terms of R&D, but also then production of uh, the different materials and technologies for energy efficiency, not that we offloaded everything to other countries. And this is bringing multiplier to the job. So we talked about the jobs in the construction industry, but it's not only the construction industry. You need to get all the materials. You need to get uh, all the technologies uh, done and produced. And I think these are additional jobs that should not be overlooked. And that's also at the same time a risk in terms of the supply chain bottlenecks what we see now with the global disruption of the supply chains down to the uh, increase in uh, the prices of construction materials is already putting some strains and kind of uh, pressures on the estimates of what can be delivered with the RRF money. Now, last but not least, getting to the money. Yes, we have to be more ambitious. And actually, I think there is still space for grants, but what we really need to look at is how to combine public and private funding. And uh, yes, I'm going towards the taxonomy uh, where I'm the group shadow, because I think this is this is what taxonomy is for. We have clear here number of uh, a fully sustainable, so fully green activities, but also enabling activities. So you want to invest into factory that is going to produce, uh, I don't know, uh, energy regulation equipment. That's an enabling activity. So it's also taxonomy compliant, maybe not that, not fully green, but still something that is taxonomy compliant. And I think this is where we can't wait any longer for um, having the uh, delegated act uh, on the uh, climate in force, because this is about really the, the mitigation and the properly green activities uh, and links to the enabling activities. And I think this is where we need to see, and I would like to hear also, and I had discussions with, with, with banks uh, in Slovakia, which are part of, of the kind of international banking houses, and they're very, very keen to start looking for models of combining public and private money, getting it out to the consumers, and in collaboration with, uh, with the state, establishing local technical assistance. So I was happy to hear these um, intentions Within Slovakia, I think this is something which we need to see and uh, across the Europe. I hope we manage to make it happen in Slovakia, but we need to see it across the Europe when the efforts and the possibilities get closer to people. They will have, a, you know, especially to the to the uh, people who are facing energy poverty, they will have a programs of combining private and public finance to get the reconstructions done. We should not overlook those who are renting in rentals because that's where something where they can they might want to do that, but they might not be able to influence the the owners uh, of the buildings, and really use it more as a as a lever also uh, to the private the public finance should be a lever to get additional private finance uh, using the taxonomy framework, and I think this is this is a great opportunity to really multiply the money that we're putting in. And again, it's for me not a subsidy, it's an investment. Mm -hmm. and it's really investment, not just, and I agree with you, not just in our future and survival as a civilization, but actually it makes perfect business sense. Mm -hmm. And I think this Thank is you. what we have yeah. to also keep on repeating. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I mean, between the two sets of comments uh, that you've both uh, brought to the floor, we see the breadth of the issues that need to be addressed in order to uh, really give buildings the, the chance to contribute to, to climate change. And I see a number of questions coming in <clears throat> on the uh, Q&A box to me. Uh, they cover the taxonomy, they cover other elements, but there's a couple of things I thought might be interesting to just tease out with you first. And so I'm going to put two things on the table. First of all, in terms of financing, uh, there is a uh, an event that we're that's taking place in the framework of Renovate Europe tomorrow, where a concept for a mortgage portfolio standard is going to be launched, where part of the idea is to have preferential loans or additions to an existing mortgage available at every street corner in Europe, uh, where uh, and available because the banks would be obliged to improve the energy performance of the assets that they hold in their mortgage portfolios over time in the same way as a minimum energy performance standard works at the individual building level 
uh, and uh, that will be launched tomorrow. So I wonder what you think about that. Is that a good idea uh, uh, to have a mortgage portfolio standard for banks? Secondly, you'll both be aware that the Renovate Europe campaign has been a, a, a promoter of deep energy renovation over time. And the buildings directive will be revised. Should we have a definition of deep energy renovation so that uh, the market and the actors know what level of performance they should be targeting with their policies? Uh, how would we incorporate that in the directive? Uh, I mean, I think from our perspective, understanding what uh, savings should be achieved for a building to be described as having been deeply renovated is important. And we have the idea of building renovation passport setting out a roadmap to deep renovation that might take place in stages. And uh, Sean, I know that in the in the report you've been uh, tackling a bit this this uh, this issue, and that there's uh, some words around trigger points. Are there moments in the life of a building when a certain work should take place? So those two topics, um, mortgages, trigger points, deeper renovation. Maybe Sean, you you you'd go first, give a reaction. Uh, you have to unmute yourself again. There was some background noise. Uh, very good. Thank you, Mr. Kevin, <coughs> and thanks to Martin also for giving us some uh, very interesting points. Yeah, obviously you can't do this without money, but there is a lot of money being made available now uh, for the overall renovation strategy, which is good, and I think that has to filter down. And your idea of a mortgage portfolio actually makes an awful lot of sense because every industry, every business, every individual in Europe has now a responsibility to help us meet our targets. Fit for 55 mm. by 2030, zero emissions by 2050. So banks, of course, have to give priority uh, to aspects that are helping the Green Deal to reach those targets and make it easier for people and give assurances as well. Then the whole question you mentioned about deep innovation, I think this is where <coughs> The Commission has to change its approach, and that's why I mentioned uh, the LTRSs. No point in leaving up to the member states to come up with different proposals, all different. <clears throat> the Commission has to come up with a template, and within that, then the member states work. And that's to take in all the points you mentioned, uh, financing in the broader front uh, at European level, financing at member state level, financing at municipality level, at bank level, individual level. It has to take into account renovations, the type of renovations. And as you said, particularly in relation to the sale of buildings and the renting of buildings. that have to be targets. <coughs> and if you don't meet them, then you should not be able either to rent or charge the going rate. That has to be looked at. <coughs> and then, as I mentioned also, the energy performance certificates. They have to be based on actual performance, not estimations. And they have to be interlinked with the building renovation passport, the digital building logbook, and the smart readiness indicator. All those things are huge. And this is where the Commission has a huge job now to more or less bring the generalities into uh, particularities. And going mm. back to Martin's point as well, the whole question of skills and workforce, they probably aren't there at the moment. So that will involve firstly an educational piece where member states have to encourage, uh, particularly the vocational education sector, to ensure that the graduates are fit to do this. And also to give those who are practicing in this area at the moment, uh, and with kind of general again uh, qualifications, real qualifications on what's needed in terms of be it uh, electricians or plumbers or construction workers or people doing insulation etc all the detail is going to be hugely important so they have to kind of a list of this is good this is bad if you do this this is what you can do if you do this it's not going to be recognized and then for the general consumer as well we can give the impression to the general consumer be it a group of people renting an entire block or individual house owners or whatever, that this is all a kind of a burden. 
we have to take the burden off them and say this is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. An opportunity, first of all, to ensure that you play your part in Europe's targets. Secondly, to ensure that you have a healthier house for your family, a healthier place to live. And that's something we're not putting enough emphasis on. And thirdly then, that you can actually save money. And this is where smart buildings are going to be so important. Charging points, which uh, Martin referred to, all those things incorporated. And it will create a sense of enthusiasm amongst people. And then the reason I mention targets for municipalities is what you'll find then is that this is going to become kind of the buzz thing to do. They'll be talking about it. And they'll be comparing one municipality with the next. And it will be like a football team. We want our team to be better than the next team. To do that, we have to train. We have to get good players. And I think we have to create that sort of enthusiasm because I have no doubt that at heart, almost every single European would be in favour of what we are talking about here. It actually makes sense. But we must also make it attractive. And then, mm -hmm. making it attractive, we must be able to say, no, there you go. All the supports are there. The construction workers are there. The engineers are there. The architects are there. As you mentioned at the very beginning, the mortgages are there. And you can manage it this way. And over 10 or 20 years, you'll be saving money. And of course, the final point, which we haven't emphasized either, many of these buildings can create excess energy, which they could sell onto the grid. Because when I was involved in the renewable energy file, that's one of the areas we fought tooth and nail for against the council, was to ensure that every single consumer and every single co-op and society could create their own energy, which could be sold back. So if we take it all together, it's, it's a no-brainer, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Mark, let's go. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Let's go. Very positive <laughs> message, Sean. Thank you. Uh, Martin, what's your reaction to what you've heard? I actually going to start by uh, following up on, on 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 the grid issue because uh, I think you know, it's equally important for the for for uh, the uh, housing renovation segment because we are indeed having a problem with the grid not being ready for mass deployment of renewables uh, electron mobility and actually let's put it this way our grids are not properly ready for 21st century which is extremely sad about the uh, reality and we need to speed up this. Uh, because this is connected also to building renovation. This is connected to the fact that uh, one wants to have housing, which is uh, energy independent, but you not necessarily have to have battery or storage in place and everything. And also the, the I would say the, mod, the, how, the sustainable housing, uh, not the future of now, uh, can be part of the storage and kind of network balance, balancing. So this is this is about having the the grid, uh, the electricity grid, as as not something based on a 19th century centralized model, but really vibrant, connected, and diversified, and therefore much more stable system. Now, in terms of the uh, mortgage portfolio standard, um, I have to say I don't know. Um, I'm not going to try to pretend that I you know can now have a really well-founded opinion on this. I will have to look into this. For me, it's, uh, I was coming probably from the, the uh, direct funding from point of view of taxonomy and having uh, some securities backed by the box. So kind of how do you label it in taxonomy? So if we go for portfolio standards in terms of mortgages, I am a bit concerned that it kind of gets repackaged and sold and repackaged and you will not really know what's in there. So I, I would see that it's using the taxonomy system. So having mortgages pile up based on the, on the uh, underlying security. So it's kind of connected to concrete activities. So you get a mortgage to improve the energy efficiency. So it could be as an activity uh, class or even adaptation. We haven't really talked about adaptation, but that's important part of proper deep renovation. Uh, you know, adaptation because then you also need less energy on top of it. Uh, so pro connected to proper activities uh, as classified within taxonomy, you could have ultimately mortgage-backed securities that are taxonomy compliant, in my view. Mm -hmm. 
uh, one would have to, you know, get the financial expertise on that. But I don't want to count now that I want all the in and outs and details of financial markets. Uh, but uh, I would be concerned about possible diluting and kind of having percentage there and, and everything else because then it's going to be too wishy washy. Uh, and uh, so on, on standards, yes, I think we need standards. We might uh, need to look at kind of the to some extent, uh, look at the geographical differences uh, because uh, the performance in areas where there is uh, minus 30 in the winter and plus 10 in summer is different, but uh, ultimately recognizing the differences, but not using it as excuse for being less efficient because then in down south you need to have anyway the proper insulation to make sure that when it's hot, uh, you don't spend all the energy in summer air conditioning, uh, and you do it uh, properly. So uh, we should have standards. I like the idea actually uh, uh, of having certain things done stepwise. It might not be possible to do everything now. So financially, we just have to make sure that it's not that we don't end up in um, dead end roads or stranded investments. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, subsidies for gas boilers for me is uh, now not a good idea, <laughs> especially if it's not mandated. But okay, you first have to do a deep renovation, and then you might consider whether you want to have a have a gas a subsidy for gas boiler on top of it. So that's where, and even then, you can go for for gasification and, and a heat pump. I think in in mm -hmm. much better way because. You're not changing uh, your heating source every 10, 15 years. This is a long term thing. So uh, standards, yes, uh, faced things with, with conditions and if done properly. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I see that uh, Sean must have had a hard stop at five o'clock because we've just drifted over the, the, the hour. Uh, so I can't thank him in person, but I hope his staff are still on board so that they can hear how much we appreciate what Sean has said. And Martin, I think I will draw the debate to a close. Uh, it's clear that uh, were we in an in-person circumstance, we could continue a discussion maybe over a beer. That would be very nice. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and uh, that we will keep in touch over the period ahead. There were a number of questions I didn't get to from the question and answer box. We will, of course, record those. And uh, if it's appropriate, we will come back uh, with answers. So Martin, thank you once again for being with us this afternoon. Thank so you very much for the Okay, thank you. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found that this conference was uh, stimulating and informative. And uh, for us in the Renovate Europe campaign and for our partners, uh, you can be sure that over the coming period, we will continue to track developments uh, in this field and report back on them in particular on what's happening with uh, energy renovation programs and schemes under the recovery plans in the next five years to 2026. There's one thing that I wanted to say earlier, so I'll put it on the record, which is that um, one of the other findings of the study is that this uh, five-year period should put us on a footing to make sure that there's no stop-start in 2026 when the recovery funding runs out that the long-term renovation strategies to 2050 remain fully active and fully funded by the member states. We see that as a key issue. In terms of what the Parliament have uh, shared with us, we can see that there's a lot of work ahead. Understanding how to get the balance right across the different directives will be a challenge in the period ahead. And Renovate Europe and its partners will work in that direction. So once again, I want to thank my own staff, uh, the E3G and the graphic designers for helping put this event together and make it uh, what I think has been a rollicking success. And just before I go, uh, for those of you who are Brussels based and who've registered, remember we meet tonight to celebrate the 10 years of the campaign. And uh, we will be there in person with you, uh, well, hopefully in about half an hour for those who can make it. Uh, so with that, I wish you all a good end of the day and I look forward to interacting with you in the months and years ahead. Thank you for your attention. Bye.